We're in a series called Real Love in an Angry World. And I want to ask all of you to welcome every campus that is listening in right now. Come on. Thank you for that. But, but I just want to say the title of this talk is weird, but it, it describes where I want to go. And it's entitled Squiggly Lines Are Not Real Love. And the reason why I want to talk to you this way is because I, I sense that I am in a trend at times, along with some of you, to try to redraw the lines of what the Word of God says. In the name of love, but not in the name of love. And in fact, typically you don't hear these angles uh, from us as a church because I'm constantly trying to speak to the people who are angry all the time and who are always judgmental. And, uh, and so when I started out, actually putting this together, even in a book, uh, Real Love and Angry World, I, I was thinking about the tension uh, that we have because there is a lot of tension, but the world is getting darker. Uh, I hope you can pick up on that. And it is getting angrier, but the problem is so is the church. We're getting angrier and more and more frustrated. And we're not very good at loving people who are in trouble. And so I wanna talk about that as straight as I possibly can. But I do know that the Bible that the Spirit of God backs me on this topic. So I love the way that we reformed a lot of our heart, even in that last song that uh, we were singing and praying. But look at this verse in 1 Peter. Uh, it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. There's a lot of people who do not want to be Christ followers because Christians have done a lousy job of doing that, gentleness and respect. But I'm not really going to be preaching to that particular crowd today. I'm going to talk to the other crowd that's always giving grace. And so they clicked over, but so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. In other words, we just do it so right uh, that it's obvious that, that we love people. But it also needs to be obvious that we adore the Word of God and we're not going to try to redraw it with squiggly lines that no longer look anything like the original intent of the Word that's already been spoken that doesn't shift around like shadows. And that's what I want to speak about this day. Uh, I remember many years ago, my pastor was speaking to a men's meeting and, uh, and it was a lot of men there, but there was one man standing in the back and, uh, and you could tell that he had not spent a lot of time in church. I can't remember how I knew that. I think someone told me that was their friend, but somehow I knew that. And so I, as the sermon was going, I couldn't even think about the sermon directly. I was just thinking about him, like my heart was going out to him. Uh, but at the end, this pastor called a lot of men up front who wanted to settle accounts with their relationship with God. And, uh, and, and I went over to this man. He wasn't moving, but I could tell he was disrupted, like something was going on. So I walked up to him just like anybody would. And I said, hey, how are you? Do you need anything? Are you okay? And he said, no, I'm not okay. I need to be born free. And I said, sir, I need to be born free. And I said, do you mean born again? And he said, I don't know what you call it. I just need God. I'm going to tell you right now, that's where a lot of people are. But if we don't tell them what the truth of the word is, how are they going to know how to settle their relationship with God? So some of us, we just bring over a truth with a lot of anger and frustration. And then others, we, we don't even know what the truth is anymore. So we can't bring that. So I've often said that grace without truth is really not grace. And truth without grace is really not truth. How do you have both? This reminds me again, I'm going to tell you a few stories and I'm going to get right into the word. It's going to be a little punchy today, but we got to track. Uh, years ago when I was single in my early 20s, I lived right next door to this girl who was also single and she's very pretty and she was a Christ follower and, and she was kind. But there was one thing I didn't like about her at all and that was she had a cat. She owned a cat. For crying out loud, why would you do that? And I think cats are cute, uh, but I'm allergic to them, and I'm proud of that. I don't want to be close to them. And, uh, 
And I don't know how they got on the planet. I don't know how they made it. I don't know how they made it in the ark. I know Noah didn't let them in. They had to sneak on there. I know that. Uh, but I'm kidding. So don't send me emails about that. Just chill out. You're the one I'm preaching at right now. But this lady had a cat. So I was thinking, man, if she, if she was to get rid of that cat, I think I'd like to get to know her. But then one day I got in my car. She loved that cat. How many of you have cats and you just love your cat? Look at these people. So she was like that. And so uh, one day I cranked up my little Maxima and I started it. It's like, I don't know much about engines. So I usually just pop the engine when something like that happens and stare and just hope I recognize something different. And, and I did notice something different. It was a cat that was in the fan And it was mangled up and totally, it was no longer breathing. Let's just call it like that. It took me a while to peel it out. And and I thought it was her cat, but I was just hoping that it wasn't. And so this stupid idea, I wrapped it in a blanket and the head was not messed up. Uh, So I wrapped it in a blanket and I had to know it was hers. So I went to her house and I knocked on her door And I said, hey, she goes, hey, Rick, how's it going? I said, pretty good. Uh, (laughs) Okay. And it was going better a little while ago. (laughs) And then I said, is this yours? (laughs) And she went, oh, man, it was tough. I'm just thankful I never went out with that girl. She's got another gear. Woo, Lord. But the problem was me. I was a fool to do that. It was stupid. But I tell you, something else would have been dumb. And if that would have been, I would have just hid the cat. And then she would have said, hey, Rick, have you seen my cat? You lost your cat? Where is it? I don't know. He was just here. I I don't know where he went. Well, I'll help you find it. And I'm walking around, meow, meow. (laughs) Some of us, we walk over like fools to share what happened to us in Christ. And others of us, we act like it never happened. And I just want to say that either one of those. Now, the reason why most of my sermons go towards the angry And the frustrated, instead of those who just love, just love everybody and exclude everybody, all sin, no matter what type sex, it's all good. I just love people like Jesus. That's a squiggly line. Because he loved way more than you could. But he called things that were right, right, and things that were wrong, wrong, because you can't have hope without that. But I understand what you're up to. You're going around trying to express a lot of love because a lot of people have done such a lousy job. You feel like you have to make up for it. I get that. And as a pastor, through the years, I just wrote down some of the mean-spirited people who have sent me either emails. I didn't write down their names so y'all can relax. But I wrote down some of these stories that I remembered. One time someone said, NLC would be blessed by the Almighty, but it's cursed because... You only have one cross on one side. For a little bit of time, we only had a cross on one side of the wall and not the other side. And it drove this person crazy and said, Jesus died in the center. If you're going to put them on the side, you have to have at least two. And I was thinking, wow. I can see that Jesus is not in the center of who you are. I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. They actually said, don't you see what steeples are? They're in the center of the church and the cross is on top of it. One person literally told me that the kids check in at New Life Church was the equivalent of the mark of the beast because the way we set them up. And I was thinking and didn't say it, but I think I see a mark on a beast. Uh, One lady told me that she was in adultery. This is how crazy people can move the word around. One lady told me she was in adultery because her husband was literally the antichrist and she was paying him back with adultery. Some people can work the word, bro. (laughs) One person told me that our music stirs up emotion and that Jesus never got emotional. So whenever it happens, it's demonic. 
and that you've got to settle that down. And then I was thinking, well, we're not trying to stir up emotion. We're just in love with the Lord. But Jesus did get emotional. Go and read what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane and see what happened when he looked at Jerusalem and he saw that they were unrepentant. And the Bible says he wept because they would not repent. One particular lady came here and she said, uh, the gentleman who plays music, plays the guitar, you know, the guys on the stage that play music, I mean, they're artsy, they don't dress like a lot of you hunters out there. And this guy had a low V, like a low, but it wasn't low, it was just about right here. And she said, that guitar player is making my daughter stumble. <laughs> and I was like, I think I know who's caused your daughter to stumble. So you see why I preach? A lot of sermons aiming, to, aiming towards the judgmental. But there's another side that has to be taught as well. And I apologize for not going this route enough. And this is my last story. But I was at the mall one time. There was a man who was in our church who loved God. And he loved his family. He lived well. He lived righteously. But he met this girl at work. And then he fell into sin abandoned his family, hurt his family and his friends and his small group. It was a mess, man. So we tried to, to love him, tried to, and we did. We have to get this right as a church. But at some point, I clicked out, and I just got mad. I stopped praying for him. I didn't want what was best for him. I just cared about his family. So one day I was at the mall and when I saw him, he saw me and he hid. He jumped behind a petition. And I saw that. And my first thought was so ridiculous. My first thought was, see how he hid? It's the anointing on my life. He's convicted of his sin and he's hiding. And then the Holy Spirit said, no, sir. He's not hiding because of that. He's hiding because you don't love him. And if you did, he would run to you. Second way, I ran to him, and I, I said, hey, man, when you saw me, I saw you was hiding. I saw you hide. He goes, I wasn't hiding. I said, I saw you like you saw me. I saw you, and you hid. I, was, I said, man, you, I saw you, and you hid. And, okay, I was hiding. <laughs> I said, but I know why. It's because it's clear I haven't loved you well in this season, and I'm sorry. Let me tell you the rest of the story. I still called what he was doing sin. I didn't start going over to his Instagram account talking about how cool his picture was with his lover. I just loved him and kept it clear. And I just want to say that like, like two weeks ago when I was talking to the millennials, I was saying to the millennials, let me tell you what's, what's wrong with your generation. And we're the one that, that gave you this. So, so hold on. But I said, millennials, the reason why a lot of you have trouble finding love is because you've already found it. You love yourself. You just want to be liked. And it's hard to raise a kid like that. It's hard to have parents like that. But the generation above them is even worse. That's the reason why the generation above you has had the highest adultery rate ever, the highest divorce rate ever, the highest suicidal rate, the highest debt rate. The reason why someone would commit suicide is because it's all about them. Like they don't even get, it's the most selfish thing a person can do because they're saying, I don't care about the pain of everyone around me. I just want to take care of me. And then when you stay in love with yourself long enough, like millennials and even my generation, there comes a time where you no longer can even love the Lord. Like it's just so, so hard. We don't even know it. In fact, it gets to a point that we literally think we love people more than the Word does. Because we give more grace than the Word does. But more grace is not more love. There has to be truth in it too. Can somebody say amen so I don't get my feelings hurt up here? <laughs> Let me just tell you something right now. Look what Jesus did. When the woman was caught in adultery, he went to her and he said, I don't condemn you, but listen carefully. He said, I don't, because they were trying to kill this woman. He said, I'm not going to throw rocks at you either. And neither do I condemn you, 
but he called sin, sin. He didn't water it down, because you can't love if you do that. He called sin, sin, and then he said, now go. Sin no more. Like, you've got to change now. This is as good as it gets when you, when you follow after the Lord. So on the topics of sex and the issues of sex, we could go into just about anything. What I love about God is that God invented sex. What an incredible God. Thank you, Lord. But for it to be on the table only in a marriage, not in pre-marriage, in marriage with your spouse, and I just want to encourage you that a biblical marriage is extremely clear. And it's, I think the best way to say it is that marriage is God's intellectual property between a man and a woman. But we get off track and we want to go in a thousand directions. And then so many people are judgmental and mean and yell at people and stand on street corners and look so bizarre and weird. And we just want to go over and love everybody and just say, Jesus loves everybody. And he does love, but the word is unmovable. So for those of you, for a minute I want to talk to you, who it's just about love, 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 and including, and everything is except. Jesus just loved everybody. The Bible says that in the end times that a lot of people will be saying, peace, 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 where there really is no peace. Having a form of godliness, but no power. And I just don't want to be a part of a church like that. And I move in this direction too sometimes. And I'm a pastor. Because it's getting so complicated. Look at the riots on the street. Look at racism. Look at white supremacy. And the tension and the anger of all that. I don't understand a lot of that because I'm white. But when you get people that are angry against you and then you realize that's not how Jesus would do it, you just want to walk over to someone and give them love. And I understand that. But if you walk over and they have crossed the boundary lines of what the Word says and then they want to know what the Word says, we can't kick it out. So how do you have consistent Jesus-type love in a complex world with the di different political views and even raising kids and on what a biblical marriage is or even with smoking pot? I had somebody send me a verse the other day that said, the Bible says that God made the green herbs to eat. I don't smoke pot, but I make brownies. It's like, what? That's a squiggly line. There was a lady this week who pulled her Porsche into a parking spot and it was a homeless person was trying to sleep there. So they got into a fight. I don't know all the details, but I do know she took out a gun and shot him. My friend Buck Hornsby in Louisiana in a city called, uh, forget the name of it. I always say you gotta be tough at the bluff. So it's bluff something, Bluff Creek. He was out on his trail in front of his house that he walks every day. And a man just got mad at the way he was walking, pulled his car over, took out a, a shotgun and shot him, knocked him to the ground, shot him again while he was on the ground. And he got up running and he shot him again. Thank God it was bird shot. Attention in the world. So who's going to love? Like, are we ever going to out love Jesus? Like, who loves the most, you or Jesus? Is it the cross you carry or the cross he carried? So look at these verses. Let's just read the word. That's what I want to do. Just read the word with very little commentary because we're trying to draw straighter lines. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, drunkenness and orgies and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, this is love too, telling the truth, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at this verse in Hebrews. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. 
mark. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. I'm not making this up off the cuff. This is in the word, the ancient sacred word. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, God is joined together. Let no one separate. 1 Thessalonians 4. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own bodies in a way, or your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You're bought at a price. In fact, just keep that verse up. If you appreciate the price of forgiveness, look, there's not a righteous person in this room. We all need grace. We all have to appreciate the old rugged cross. And if you appreciate that price, give the Lord some praise Come on, right now. You need it. You need it. Can't forget that. But hold on. So, therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, the scripture is just impeccably clear. It's like real love. Like if somebody's driving over a hill and you know, cause you just came there over that hill is a road that just drops off. Like somehow a mudslide happened and it's 300 feet drop off over that hill. And you just yell out, I love you. That's probably not love. Maybe you need to say, I love you. So you better stop now. Maybe that's closer to love. So how do we live without squiggly lines? Number one, don't be dumb. Just don't be dumb. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. It's fun to say. It's a blast to tell people that. Look at these few verses. Proverbs eleven thirty: The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. And that's the whole thing. Could you look here for a minute? It is so hard to win people to Christ right now if you're not wise, like this is what we, you have to pray about the most. Like, how do I gain favor with this person who hates Christians, who's an atheist, or has their own ideas? Listen, it's never up to us to argue to change people's minds. The Bible doesn't ask us to change minds. It asks for us to change hearts through his name. And the only way that can happen is through wisdom. Because it's not about bringing a bloody cat over and goes, this yours? We're going to have to have wisdom. It says it right here, Colossians 4, 5. Let wisely or live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations, here's the wisdom, be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Like that moment when they really want to know the truth. Thank you for your patience on this. Second Samuel 14, 14 says, all of us must die eventually. You can Google it and we're all gonna die. Raise your hand if you're convinced that one day you will, all right? Then our lives are like the water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, this is your God. He devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Could y'all look here for a minute? He's got an incredible plan to reach the person that you're trying to love. Number two, don't be a tyrant. Winsboro Baptist Church, they are known, I don't know where they're located, but they are known as a church that will go to funerals for military people who have been killed on the battleground. And they will stand outside and pick it and said, your son died because of the sin of the land you live in. And there was a pastor in his church that went to the shelters of the Houston flood and they took beds in there too to sleep there in the shelter, not because they needed it, because they had a plan. And they brought signs and they got up every day holding up these signs and I can't quote them 
but it was something like, if you would have repented, the flood waters would have not hit your home. Don't be a tyrant. Second Peter, this is the heart of God. This is the side of Christ. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. But everyone to come to repentance. That's what he wants. And then lastly, don't compromise. Okay, everybody look here and we're just gonna settle this and then we're done. I just want you to look at any squiggly lines you may be drawing. In Seattle, we got this report. I'm sure this happens in other places, but there's a pastor there that told us that they're teaching sex education there right now. It might be happening here, I don't know. Sometimes my head is in a hole in the ground. But they're literally teaching in, to the 11, 11 year olds to about 14 years old. That, uh, that in sex education class, that with sex, you have to investigate. You're in the explore stage. So go and explore and find out what your sexual preference is, what your gender is. You gotta kick some tires to find out what's best for you, like what you want. Dig deep into what you want and figure that out. Hebrews Chapter 2 says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift. Everybody say drift. When I was a kid, you don't do this as much as an adult, but when you're a kid, you would go to the beach, you would stay out in the water for a lot longer. I mean, you might be out there all day. Well, after several hours, you'll look back at the shore and you'll realize, whoa, I didn't even know we drifted away down. Now, as an adult, I go in there for three minutes, I don't drift that much. But it's the shore that shows you how far you drifted. Well, what shows us in our spiritual life how far we've drifted? It's the word. Or we may drift away from it. Look at this next verse. So don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Because only he can into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God, what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And look at this last verse, talking about the word of God. God means what he says. And what he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it, no matter what. And this is what David learned when he said, Lord, there's no place to go can't go to any other place. So I'm asking you to search my heart and to see if anything inside of me is no longer like you. And that's the way I think we should all pray. It gives us clear lines again because some of our lines have gotten way too squiggly and that is not real love in an angry world. Let's bow our heads.